for taking the time to watch these compilation of videos that we hope you will find meaningful. As you begin, be aware that difficult topics are going to be addressed. All sorts of emotions may come out for you. We want to take an opportunity to normalize that for you and also to remind you to reach out for help. There will be resources available at the end of this presentation and also at the bottom of the screen below the video. Uh, please know that you are not in this alone and you have people that you can talk to uh, and we invite you to make use of those resources. Good evening, I'm Dr. Ron Bachner, President of the Medical Staff. Welcome to our quarterly medical staff meeting. Um, I look forward to the day when we can all meet in person again. One day this pandemic will end and those will be good times again. We have learned many lessons through this pandemic. And although physician burnout was talked about before the pandemic, it has certainly come to the forefront of physician wellness and clinician wellness and everyone who gives care as a real issue. Today's program, which is uh, uh, chaired by Dr. Anthony Tobaya, our psychiatry chair, I think will be very important for you to listen to. You'll hear testimonials from individuals who've had a variety of issues that affected them clinician, cl clinically and um, psychologically and how they dealt with it, both during the time of the pandemic and before. And these are touching stories. And I think you will gain some insight into what happens and what is available to you to help you deal with stressful situations. In the last month alone, we've had three tragic cases involving small children who came to our ER. And we have a crisis team that Dr. Tobiah has set up that can respond to the well-being of the staff who had to be involved in these cases. And well, you know, we try to put on a facade and do the work we do and close the chapter on that when we leave, but sometimes it's hard to do so. I think you'll find this program that lies ahead of you very interesting and I hope you learn from it. COVID absolutely had a big impact on myself and on other members of our palliative care team. Um, we saw a lot of a lot of death, unfortunately, and a lot of suffering, so especially a lot of breathlessness. Um, I, we went through a period where I felt like all the patients kind of looked the same. They were like young to middle-aged men um, that we just couldn't get off the ventilator. They'd be on for 50, 60, 70 days, um, and families just were really struggling with um, you know, accepting that this was the reality on somebody that was perfectly healthy before maybe some small comorbidities. Um, many of them were dependent on them financially, emotionally. Um, you know, some of them, many of them had young children. So, you know, it's when that started to happen where there was this pattern, you know, it, it started to take more of a toll because I felt like we weren't making any progress with anybody. We weren't seeing people uh, kind of make it out that had that, you know, that same scenario. Um, and one case in particular is something that kind of still I can hear in my sleep or when I lay down at night. Um, you know, it was a, a young man, probably 52. Um, he had a few children, one daughter in particular that I spoke to on a regular basis. Um, and we got close, you know, I think she really trusted me. And she shared with me, you know, that it wasn't their family's tradition or culture to, uh, to take somebody's life. So to consider taking him off the ventilator was not something that they would do. Um, every time I would do a FaceTime on the tablet, you know, she would just cry and encourage him and tell him to take deep breaths and, you know, all in Spanish. Um, sometimes there'd be small children in the background, his grandchildren that would be looking on and he was unresponsive and, uh, you know, on a ventilator. and. It's a little scary, you know. Um, we talked about whether or not it was appropriate for everyone to sort of see him in that condition, but that was their choice. Um, 
But finally, over time, and you know, it was many weeks, uh, she finally was agreeable to you know, the fact that he was dying and she was willing to take him off the machine. Uh, we did another meeting with extended family members and made a plan to take him off. And we spent one last time in the room together uh, with him on the tablet and, you know, her looking on. And it's just, uh, I still hear her crying um, in Spanish, you know, telling him how much she loves him and how much he means to everyone and how he'll never be forgotten. And, it, you know, it's just, as much as she was saying it was okay for him to go, she still continued to tell him, please live. Um, so it was, it was hard to hear her still go against the grain of what was intrinsic to her, which is that he should live, um, but accept the fact that he was dying and she needed to release him. So I try really hard to like kind of quell that when I hear her um, because it, it affects me where uh, I feel like I can't come back maybe the next day and do it again. Um, you know, the way I kind of get peace about it is I just feel extremely privileged to have experienced that with somebody to be there uh, during such a delicate time. Um, they never once visited him, not even through the window. It was during the height of COVID when we absolutely had no visitors. Um, and she really relied on me to be that conduit uh, to him. Uh, the nurses were great. They also FaceTimed, and um, that was really the, um, you know, the only way they got to connect. So I just feel really blessed. I feel lucky that, you know, she trusted me and that I got to be a part of that. And, and that's how I feel about all those cases, you know, as sad as it is, um, if myself and my palliative care colleagues, if we were help in facilitating um, these connections, these you know, last moments, last weeks together. Um, I just feel like it's a gift from God that, that I was there, that, uh, that I was able to um, be a part of that with them, and uh, I don't know what it would have been like for them if they didn't have that. Um, you know, I can't imagine losing somebody, dropping them off at the hospital and never seeing them again, um, and that happened to so many people. In the course of my life, I've uh, delivered or supervised or assisted in the birth of uh, approximately 6,000 babies. And I had an incident approximately four and a half years ago, um, which would have been baby approximately 5,700 for me, whereby I delivered a baby with uh, neurological injuries. The uh, child was impaired after birth. Uh, it uh, was apparent right from the beginning when the child was, was born that it was uh, having some issues and I followed the baby over the course of the next few days when it was in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit and it became apparent that the baby um, had what's called hypoxic uh, ischemic encephalopathy which is uh, a neurological condition uh, you see in some, some newborns. Um, needless to say, I... Uh, I delivered the baby on that day, which I still remember today. And uh, I mark that day mentally um, every single year. I pause, I think, and uh, I remember the events very clearly, even all these years afterwards. I delivered that baby on that day, and I had other women in labor, so I, I had to jump from that room to other rooms and take care of my other patients went through my day, and uh, at the end of the day, I, I remember going back up to the neonatal intensive care unit, as I did every day, for many days, watching the baby's uh, progress through the various care that the uh, staff there was, was giving the baby. But in the weeks and months that followed, it became apparent that the child was going to have some neurological deficits. And um, with this realization, I started suffering. I found myself... Um, reliving the delivery events, the, 
the various processes. I, I really found that it was hard to get out of my head during times when I was alone and not engaged in some other activity. Um, for instance, I uh, have a very busy professional life. Um, when I was engaged in patient care, I would focus on the patient care. But when, when I was not, which would be my drive into work, my drive home, um, I found myself really just reliving it over and over and over again. I um, would find that it would wake me up from sleep sometimes. Um, and uh, when I would wake up at night, I found that I was thinking about that. Um, it became something that disturbed my sleep. One of the things I do for relaxation is I, um, I sail. I have a little sailboat. I'm rather fond of uh, sailing it. And I like to um, think of that as my serenity. That's where I go to escape the stresses of my day, my week, my work and had been doing so for many, many years. I've been a sailor for, for decades. Yet I found that during the times when I normally would have serenity from um, sailing, I was no longer getting serenity. I was constantly thinking about that day, the delivery, the child, the implications. What would its life be like? How, how are the parents doing? How are they handling all this? And I found myself becoming more and more engulfed in those thoughts during any time I was not engaged in doing something. So I started looking for ways to stay busy. I tried to occupy myself every moment of the day. I took on projects. I took on tasks. I brought work home with me just so that I could focus on the work and not have to think about what um, kept popping into my head. And with the sleep disturbance and the realization that I was having a really tough time relaxing on any level, I would not be refreshed to do the work that I needed to do every day. I would come to work fatigued because I just wasn't sleeping well at night. And uh, I came to realize that I had a problem. And what I did was I reached out to the Department of Psychiatry and I made an appointment and I'm really glad I did. There I found a set of ears, Dr. Matt Menza, who has since retired from our staff, but um, he listened to my story. I had two or three sessions whereby he uh, listened to what I had to say and what I was going through and he realized I was suffering from PTSD over this one incident. Despite all the work I had done, all the other things that I've done in my life, all the people I interacted with, all the lives saved, injuries prevented, all, all these other things, I seemed to be obsessed with thinking about this one case. So Dr. Menza, realizing what I had going on, set me up with a therapist. and. Uh, I would meet with that therapist on a regular basis, discuss what I was going through, and I found it very, very helpful. I really didn't speak to anyone about this. I didn't, I didn't speak to my partners. I didn't speak to my spouse. I, I really just tried to internalize it because I'm supposed to go about my day and take care of people and not really think about anything but taking care of them. And, and that worked just fine when I was engaged in plying my trade and my profession. I delivered a few hundred babies after that point, And um, I don't know how many operative procedures I did, but I found myself unable to relax until I started seeking help. And that help came to me. With each session that I met my therapist, I found myself thinking about my dilemma and uh, what tasks I had to do to um, really start healing from that because I really just couldn't continue living my life that way where I couldn't rest, I couldn't relax. What I do is stressful, what I do is dangerous and uh, on many levels I, I, I really need to be clear. So I found that seeing the therapist really made a big, big difference for me. 
uh, she realized what I was going through. Apparently she had dealt with other physicians going through traumatic events as I did. And with time, I started feeling better. And I can't tell you how, how good it was with the passage of time and the visits to my therapist to st suddenly start sleeping again at night and being able to relax during those times in the week where that was available to me. And I found myself, um, with the passage of time, thinking about that situation less and less. Um, it still pops into my head during various uh, times or various situations. Um, in my role as, uh, as president of the medical staff, I'm involved in all kinds of things. And I also um, found that I could help others through what happened to me. Needless to say, here at a university medical center where we are the funnel for very complicated cases, we come across cases sometimes that just don't go very well. And we see bad things happen to good people more frequently than we'd like. And the physicians involved, the nurses, the staff taking care of the baby, many of them are traumatized by these things as much as I was. And I found that reaching out to them and just lending a sympathetic ear as Dr. Menza did for me, my, the psychiatrist I saw for a few sessions, and um, the therapist I, I saw for a few sessions and found it very, very helpful. By the way, I, I still see her much less frequently now, but I find that it's good to maintain that talk, that chatter. Um, I find that by my reaching out to physicians who went through something similar to what I did, it seems to help them realize they're not alone out there, that it's okay to be sad, it's okay to feel bad, it's okay to be sympathetic and yes, and it may dwell on, uh, on your thoughts rather heavily, but with proper attention and proper therapy, there are ways to return to normalcy. I spent my first three quarters of my career as a trauma surgeon. And as a trauma surgeon, I had to deal with less than perfect outcomes. Every holiday that I celebrate, I can associate with a patient's death and dealing with their families and questioning what I could have done differently. There's one case that sticks out more than others, and it was a child who I took care of in the early 80s, um, not that far after I finished my residency at NYU Bellevue, where I felt very, very comfortable taking care of trauma and seriously injured patients. So on one Saturday afternoon, I get a call from one of my associates saying he had to leave town. Could I cover him? And so I got a call from the residents about uh, a toddler who was riding his tricycle and it started to rain and his mother decided to put the car in the garage and didn't see, he was out of the line of sight, and she ran over her child and, and they brought the child in. He was stable. To make a long story short, um, I took him to the operating room. We had just recruited the first chief of pediatric surgery here, Dr. Erwin Krasna. And so I called Dr. Krasna to help me in the operating room and the child had uh, tire tracks that went over the chest and the abdomen. It was literally a thoraco-abdominal um, injury. And there was blood in the peritoneal cavity and the 
the patient had a liver and a spleen injury and the technical aspects of it were pretty straightforward. I was able to salvage part of the spleen. I stopped the bleeding. Dr. Krasna came in and, and he was going to uh, finish and close and I went to speak with the um, parents. I went to speak with the parents and say that their, their son was, was doing okay. And I did. I went out. I found them. I spoke to them. I reassured them as doing okay. And then I went back in the operating room where the patient, the child, was uh, hemoptysizing. He had a terrible lung contusion and blood was pouring out the endotracheal tube. And we couldn't stop the, the bleeding and he died. And, and then I had to go back out and, and tell these parents, tell the mother, that um, her, her child had died. And, and, and that was uh, terrible for them, and it really scarred me. Now, at that point in time in my career, I was putting together the nuts and bolts of making uh, this hospital a, a trauma center, and it did motivate me to move along as fast as I could, getting the right pieces in place. In, in, in for that child, um, I was concerned. We didn't have an arterial catheter. We weren't. Uh, we didn't draw blood gases, and and I was upset that we we could have done better. Um, I had. A, a whole series of coping mechanisms that I really picked up through my training to deal with that type of loss and guilt. And when I look back on it from the vantage point of being a surgeon for over 40 years, I can tell where those coping mechanisms came from. Um, some of them came from the history of surgery. And the, at Hopkins, um, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, William Stewart Halstead tried to figure out how he could continually get better. And, and he would sit down with his patients after the operation while, every, while his entourage just looked on and he would ask them questions about their pain and try to figure out how to, how to do it better. As a resident, we had a Hopkins-trained cardiac surgeon, Frank Spencer, um, who always made us ask the question, what could you do differently? What did you do wrong? What are you going to do better next time? And I always took solace in that, that I could go through the process of figuring out what I could do better, and then follow that lead. So, you know, I left here in 1989. I was at Kings County, where I was chief of trauma, and I was in Philadelphia. I came back after being away for 13 years. And I took trauma call when I first came back in 2002. And one of my first nights on call, I was in the emergency department, and it looked the same as it did in the 80s. It had gray paint on the wall. The trauma room was essentially in the same spot in the emergency department. And they were bringing in two kids by helicopter. And I was waiting for them. And the next thing that I knew was I broke out in this cold sweat and I had palpitations and my mind jumped back to that time in the early 80s before we had a trauma center and I was taking care of that child. I haven't had another um, anxiety attack uh, taking care of patients. Um, I got over it very, very quickly. I focused on taking care of those patients in 2002 and um, for the most part the, the way I coped 
worked, and historically, people have written about this for surgeons. There's a book that came out in the late 70s, uh, Forgive and Remember, talking about that process of acknowledging what you did wrong and trying to do, to do it better. Um, and, and it works to a greater or lesser degree. There is a book, a more recent book, just a few years ago by Byer Shaw, Bud Shaw, who was one of the pioneers of uh, liver transplant. He did his, completed his uh, residency and then he trained at the University of Pittsburgh was on the faculty there, and, and this book is an autobiography. And um, he recounts how difficult those first years were working with Thomas Starzl, and how he had to shut down emotionally, uh, taking care of these high-risk patients and, and having them not do well. Um, to cut to the chase, he goes to Nebraska, he sets up at the University of Nebraska their liver transplant program, and then he starts to suffer from incapacitating anxiety attacks, so much so that he had to give up clinical surgery. You know, the old coping mechanisms are good. Different things work for different people. Um, I took solace in the fact that I could build the trauma program here. That helped a lot. Different people, as you've heard or will hear, have different coping mechanisms and whatever it takes to get over being the second victim, uh, you, should, you should do. Um, because this is very, very serious, and it can scar you and come back later in a small way, like it did with me, one anxiety attack, or, you know, it can be a career ender. So get the help that works for you, and don't be shy about it. I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened to me more than 15 years ago that had a huge impact on myself and an entire institution. Unfortunately, a young child you know, died as a result of a potassium overdose from parental nutrition after an appendectomy a few days later. We get a phone call in the middle of the night that something was wrong and that this child had arrested and at that point in time could not be resuscitated. We figured out shortly thereafter that the parental nutrition had 10 times the dose of potassium that was ordered. Um, we had to meet with the family and as a result of this, you know, our institution was absolutely devastated. Um, the provider, the pharmacist was overwhelmed and many of us got intimately involved in the event to say, I'm sorry to what happened with the family. And that's not where the story ends, that's really where the story begins because in this situation, we needed to go to work the next day and not really be paralyzed by this, you know, horrific, you know, medication error, but to somehow gain strength with each other and to move on and to find ways to prevent this from ever happening again. So the number of people in our institution that were impacted, the second and third victims, people that heard this, that were directly involved and other people that heard the story or had to relive the story, the number was enormous. So as part of our healing process from this event, we every year would have a safety lecture where the family, the mom, the dad, and the two brothers would come and we would give a le lecture on patient safety. And this went on year after year after year. On the 10th year, we actually decided that we would tell our story of what we've done as an institution in order to help us heal, of how we've tried to minimize mistakes or errors or prevent falls from happening or use closed loop communication or double checks or stop the line or arc it up, whatever mechanism we used in reference to patient safety. And then we decided that we would actually write a book and tell our story. And the child that um, passed away was the central part of the story. So in the book, OK to Proceed, you know, we have a dedication. And the dedication says, this book is dedicated to the memory of Rafael Miera, whose untimely death galvanized our institution to pursue patient safety with unwavering 
resolution. And it's still hard for me to talk about this today, that it's emotional and I'm one of the second victims as a result of this. And I think it's important for all of us to know that when we have an adverse event, and an outcome that results in either death or harm to a patient and indirectly to their family and loved ones, that we need to help each other heal. And it's incredibly important because we come to work every day and walk through the front door of the hospital and don't want anybody to be harmed, ever. And in anesthesia, our mantra is, no patient shall ever be harmed from anesthesia. And that's my denominator, you know, and my numerator is safety. And I don't want anybody to be harmed, and I want everybody to be safe. So I think together we need to gain strength from each other. And you can see that with the book, that with OK to Proceed, you know, which we prepared more than a decade after the event, it was our healing, and it was our way of coming together. And as the ultimate, you know, event, we dedicated the book to Rafael Miera and to his family and to stand in front of the room and to meet with the mom and the dad and the two brothers who are now teenagers was not only hard, but it was satisfying. So it was really bittersweet because we felt like we never lost our passion. We never lost our interest in getting better. And I think that we here need to make sure that that becomes part of our culture. So the minute that you stop caring is the day that you should stop caring for patients. That when you walk through the front door of the hospital and you come to work, you need to do what's best and what's safest. But if something happens, we need to have a safety net that we can open up to those people who have been harmed as a result of an event. Talking to the people directly involved in this incident you know, more than a decade later still brings tears to their eyes. And I was involved also with a group called the Medically Induced Trauma Support System that Linda Kenny started, you know, more than a decade ago that was an organization for the second victim. And I think the story is really important. That Linda was someone who had, you know, club foot, who had had multiple operations. And when she went to the Brigham for one of her, you know, 15th or 16th operation one day, they decided they wanted to do the foot procedure with a popliteal block. The anesthesiologist talked to her about it, performed the block, and unfortunately, one of the known risks, she got an intravascular injection of Marcaine, and it resulted in cardiac arrest. So for an elective procedure where she was going home, she ended up with a sternotomy in the intensive care unit at the Brigham and said, what happened? Did I have heart surgery? And they said, no, your heart stopped, but we saved your life. And she had you know, four small children, and at that point in time, she's like, well, how did this happen? So she was angry, and for a long period of time, the anesthesiologist was never able to say, I'm sorry that this happened. And I, I never wanted this to happen to you, but at the same time, I'm so happy you're alive and you're okay, because his comment was, I could have never lived with this. He left his job, his life became incredibly difficult because he couldn't apologize to the patient. So years later, he finally wrote her a note and said, I just want to say I'm sorry. And she's like, this is years later. This poor guy is still feeling remorse and is devastated by what happened that day in the OR, and she had moved on. So she started this medical-induced trauma support system for the second victim, and they lecture all over the country on this particular topic. And Linda Kenny in Boston is still you know, really pushing it on how can we take care of the second, third, and fourth victims. And I've even seen in my billing practice, you know, with anesthesia records where if they see that a patient expired and they see a, some, a younger age, you know, their curiosity may be raised. And so when we used to meet with office staff, they'd often say that it says the patient expired. So you can see even indirectly if it's a trauma and they see a young person of a child just seeing a record, you know, and being aware of an age you know, can impact people. So, you know, my message to all of you is ask people how they're doing and don't be quiet about it and talk to the person to provide them with support. And here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, we have amazing support systems in place. And I'm so excited, having been here more than two years now, that we're really embracing this incredibly important topic so we can help take care of each other.
I knew as a child that I wanted to become a physician. I was just five years old when I contracted rheumatic fever. Uh, I, from that point, I developed a long-term relationship with my family doctor, and it was he who inspired me to go on to medicine. Subsequently, everything in my adult, uh, everything in my adolescent life was uh, geared to uh, the pursuit of that uh, career. Uh, ultimately, I went to college at uh, Georgetown University. I went on to medical school at uh, the School of Medicine at Georgetown University. I subsequently came back to New Jersey, uh, which time I did my internship and my orthopedic residency right here at the uh, Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson uh, Medical School. In 1982, I completed my residency and I joined an orthopedic physician who I've known for years in one of our local communities here. And I remained in practice in that community, in that particular um, hospital institution for the next 35 years. This was only interrupted in 1986 when I took a year sabbatical to pursue my hand surgery fellowship in New York City. Uh, at that time I was married, I had two young children. Unfortunately at that time I was foolish enough to uh, get involved in a uh, uh, relationship that ultimately resulted in the dissolution of uh, my marriage at the time and also, frankly, resulted in the uh, dissolution of my pr professional partnership with uh, my colleague and my mentor. I went on to continue practice uh, in solo practice as an out of excuse me as an out of network physician uh, in the same community. Uh, I found it, uh, it was a lot of work, but I found it quite rewarding both professionally and financially. During that period, I was taking as much as 20 days of call a month. Uh, ultimately, it uh, culminated in the dissolution of my, my second marriage. Uh, concurrently, uh, I was involved, in, actively involved in uh, various uh, financial investments, uh, which in the end did, uh, did not go well. Ironically, through all that turmoil, I seemed to maintain my sanity through my work, through my relationships at work, and uh, through the care of my patients. I truly felt I had a knack for compartmentalizing uh, the different aspects uh, of my life. And reciprocally, I felt that uh, you know all the different aspects of my life were not uh, affecting my performance professionally. However, um, in the more recent years, uh, as the practice of medicine became increasingly under assault, I became increasingly intolerant of what I perceived as the regulatory intrusions, payer demands, compliance issues, operational efficiencies, EHR, that seemed to me to respond to the records of reporting and cost containment of patient care, while subordinating not only the actual care of the patients, but the welfare of the staff as well. Cyclically, my frustration increased as my tolerance for things that triggered my frustration decreased. When presented with such circumstances, I repeatedly felt justified, yet dismissed. I realize now that I became increasingly unaware of how others around me were perceiving changes that were seemingly occurring in my professional interactions and interpersonal communications. Over a recent period of five years, I was summoned before the Medical Executive Committee on four or five occasions, each time related to incidents between myself and members of the nursing staff over conflict between clinical tasks that I needed to provide and the inability to achieve the assistance and accommodations to do so. While, feel, excuse me, while feeling in each of these circumstances that my issues and concerns were neither acknowledged nor dismissed, the Medical Executive Committee remained focused solely on how my circumstances were negatively influencing my interpersonal communications in the workplace, and they referred me ultimately for counseling. I was uh, guilty of disruptive behavior, which I realized then and now was true, 
but to my dismay, without acknowledgement of my intention and efforts, each time to deliver good and prompt care. Ultimately, after hospital leadership deemed repeat violations of their citizen policy, I was referred to a physician wellness program at the Vanderbilt University. As part of that program, I participated in a 360 analysis where colleagues of my choosing were asked to provide feedback regarding their perceptions of my personal interactions. I was surprised when I saw their comments, uh, noting that my demeanor was perceived as arrogant and at times garnered fear from amongst members of my colleagues, okay, for whom that, with whom I have uh, worked alongside for uh, most of my professional career. As a result of this feedback, I opted to take a leave of absence from the clinical practice to focus on uh, my wellness. Uh, I was burned out, but would neither acknowledge nor succumb to it. The consequences of burnout, for all practical purposes, cost me nearly everything. My decisions to step back from clinical practice to focus on my recovery and wellness was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I now resume the practice. I am employed by a large multi-specialty practice doing strictly hand surgery and not doing any call. Uh, although I am working full time, I have learned to limit my office and my office schedule and my, excuse me, and my OR schedule. I am ironically acknowledged by my employer and my colleagues as a model citizen. I have learned to enjoy more time with my family, particularly my grandkids. I wish I would have learned sooner. I'm Chris Honick, the Medical Staff Communications Liaison, joined by Dr. Jim Salwitz, past president of the medical staff, current Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health board member, and of course, co-host of our Medically Necessary podcast, which you may see we are set up in kind of a podcast style tonight. I think this is a very important conversation we're going to have. Uh, we will be releasing it as a special episode of our Medically Necessary podcast uh, so that we can really try and reach as many people as we can. Yeah, nice to see you, Chris. It's uh, great to have an evening to talk about something so important as this and spend time with you lovely people. Well, and you know, for the first time in a year, we're actually going to get to do this. We're going to be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation without a mask on. But that's what you look like. <laughs> I had a shave for the first time in a year for this. It's a very special occasion. I do want to introduce our panel that we have with us for this evening. Start out over here, Dr. Anthony Tobia, Chief of Psychiatry at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Christine Davies, our Director of Pastoral Care here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Christine, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Happy to be here. And Dr. Chantal Brazo. Dr. Brazo is the Chief Wellness Officer for Rutgers uh, Biomedical and Health Sciences, the Assistant Dean of Faculty Vitality for RWJ Medical School a professor in the departments of family medicine and psychiatry at New Jersey Medical School. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So thank you all for being here this evening. You know, you've just seen uh, a series of discussions of uh, very open admissions and sharing uh, members of our medical staff about events that they have went through, um, which have obviously affected them deeply emotionally, changed how they saw life, uh, changed how they saw practice. And we're really appreciative of them for their honesty, bravery, and sharing with us this evening. We felt that this was a very important time uh, as a medical staff to focus and have a conversation on clinician wellness. Uh, medicine is supposed to be something that you love. Uh, almost everyone that goes into the practice of medicine goes in because they're the opportunity to help other people, but also for the deep satisfaction, learning, excitement, being part of their community. It's supposed to be something which you feel that you're not only giving, but you're receiving. But the reality is that medicine is very hard. 
um, and things during the course of our lives and the practice of medicine can affect us deeply, sometimes more deeply than we ever appreciate. And so it is incredibly important that we take a little time now to refocus a little bit on wellness and on finding that joy or that satisfaction and recognizing when it's gone. You know, I think a lot of people say, are saying now, well, we're getting out of COVID-19. Uh, the weather is going to be warm. We can get back to just the normal practice of life uh, and get back to practicing medicine and all will be well with the world. But I think uh, a number of people think that may not be the case. You know, Tony, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, we hear all the time about the uh, decreasing numbers of COVID, number of individuals who are currently uh, in our hospitals being discharged from our hospitals, the infectivity rate, um, all those numbers. Uh, as those numbers go down, what we are going to anticipate is an increase in the number, the, an, inc an increase or a peak in mental illness. And I think that's on the horizon. I think that's a very important topic to talk about tonight. Christine, you had similar thoughts, I think. Yeah, so for so long, um, so much of our grief has been delayed. Um, we've not been able to gather, to have funerals, to engage in whatever ritual uh, would have helped us get through this as a community. And so all of that is going to have an impact, and I think we're going to see more and more of that come out. Um, and also recognizing that... Um, uh, you know, where it can't be, people talk a lot about PTSD. I'm not, I'm the only non-clinician, so I will not comment on that. But what I can say is we are not post because this is not over. Just because the numbers are down, we are going to see the ripple effects for years. And I think the other thing to note is that medicine was already challenging. We're already in an organization going through massive change. I mean, all of the videos that you just saw were about events that occurred before. COVID made our lives that much more challenging. So when we talk about clinician wellness, uh, and, and you know, this is a long-term part of the practice of medicine, um, and not just certainly a COVID-19 phenomenon, and not just you know the, com the coming months. You know, Chantal, what are your thoughts about, I guess, what it means to be uh, to find joy? Uh, in medicine and what threatens that, you know, what threatens clinician wellness? What are the challenges that make this so hard and make this such a current problem? Well, you know, burnout existed before COVID-19 um, and about close to half of, of uh, the physicians across the country were already experiencing burnout. And then when COVID-19 settled in, that added to it and perhaps the people who were already burnt out may be more at risk of feeling some emotional distress from the addition of COVID-19. But, but why was there so much burnout even before COVID-19, I guess, is what you're asking. And well, that's before, let me actually step back a quarter of a step, just to show you know, my concreteness in this world. Um, what do you mean when you say the words burnout? So burnout, and it's a very good question because sometimes people think that burnout is like a mental disorder, and it, it's not a mental disorder. It's not a, in the DSM-5 criteria. It is a, a work-related condition, and it consists of three core elements. The one is just being exhausted, like feeling like you have nothing left to give. Uh, the second one is feeling what we call depersonalization, which is kind of that cynicism or that sense that you know, you're just sort of going through the motion, more like that robotic sense because you just, you just can't enjoy your work so much, so you just go through the, go through the motions. And then the third part of it is a, a lack of confidence, um, a lack of a sense of accomplishment. No matter how much you may have accomplished, you just don't see it. So that's what burnout is. And, and you don't have to have all of those three elements to be burnt out. You can have one of those three elements. Um, and be burnt out. And as a result of, you know, long hours, as a result of not having downtime, as a result of losing touch between, you know, your values and what you perceive your environment's values are. I mean, there's so many reasons that can lead somebody to be burnt out. Um, seeing difficult situations at work, either in the lives of people or tragedies, um, or just day to day issues with administration and, you know, the, the, the systems problem that can pile up. So all of these together can lead somebody uh, to feel these, these symptoms. Tony, if I'm self-diagnosing myself or trying to at least 
uh, developed a environment around me, a detection system around me that can start to say, in a gym, um, maybe you better st to step back a seat. You ha may have one, two, three, or develop it because, you know, what kind of warning signs might I be able to see myself, or more importantly, how would I set up a system to bring those things to my attention? Yeah, I actually, actually, I think you, you hit on it uh, because the person that's likely to see it first is the person you're closest with. Uh, so if you're married, that would be your spouse. Keep an open mind, and if someone tells you that you've changed or asks you how you're doing, it appears that you're struggling, uh, we should actually be very open-minded with regard to where that's coming from. And I think that's usually the, the initial warning sign. Even, even before we self-reflect and see it in ourselves, those closest to us, those around us, are, are very likely to see it first. I think one of the problems of clinicians, though, particularly in an environment like COVID, though, is that the disconnect of our social environments is such that it may be harder to detect those signs. You know, I mean, you know, Chris and me are joking, but ha we have done lots of interviews lately by Zoom because we have, we have to wear masks. Um, you know, so you, you lost a lot of those, those connections, et cetera. Is there things, um, how, how, can I, you know, how can I build, emphasize those kind of warning things for me? I, so the people that I love um, and the people that know me, which in this case, I think it's not only your wives, but it's also your partners. Mm -hmm. Maybe even your patients? P possibly. Um, again, and that could be verbally or non-verbally uh, in terms of um, their op uh, opening, open comments to you verbally, uh, but even non-verbally if, if there's certain data uh, that your institution collects might actually reflect that there's something going on where uh, you may not be as efficient or you, you, might, you may not be as open as a clinician uh, as you were perhaps prior to COVID. So it's something to pay attention to. And again, um, you know, a, a lot of these data are sometimes used uh, in ways that govern um, productivity, et cetera. So we usually are turned off by them, uh, but um, they may be a way that uh, uh, patients are non-verbally communicating that um, maybe it is time to reach out and maybe it is time to self-reflect. And a t potential sign or symptom of burnout would be, be changes in behavior. And we have seen issues where, you know, people, and, and not just in the clinical realm, but in, in general, they tend to act out more. That stress really weighs on them. And of course, there's also alcohol and substance abuse. And the NIH, out with uh, some data that showed a, a 15 plus percent increase in alcohol sales early in the pandemic. A uh, study in JAMA Network Open showed alcohol consumption up nearly 20% during the pandemic. How do we address, how do you support somebody who may be in the early phases of noticing, listen, I think I might be starting to have a problem. What used to be one drink on the weekends has now become one drink every night. How do we support people who may recognize some symptom or sign that they are burned out? So, you know, I think there is, there has to be a recognition that some of the symptoms that we are all experiencing as human beings during COVID, there's, there's a certain part of it that's normal. There's a certain part of the fatigue, there's a certain part of the irritability. Um, as long as it's not persistent, that is normal and that we'll all have those ups and downs as part of being dealing with COVID. That being said, if a person is starting to behave in a different way than usual on a regular basis, and typically, you know, it, it goes on for more than a couple of months, this is when I would say, yes, now, you know, you need to, to get some help. Um, and then that's where you can, you can look at, you know, what is available in your work environment um, to get formal help. In between, there's many things that can help, though. There's support from your peers. There's reaching out to your colleagues who could then help you and also tell you, look, maybe you should get some help. So there's a lot of in-betweens between realizing that, you know, maybe something's going on to actually, you know, seeking a formal mental health professional. But let's set the context of the profession that we're talking about. We're talking about a profession whose base culture doesn't support the kind of personal insight or cultural connection that makes this easy. Um, and, and I, before we you know, started you know, taping, you know, uh, Christine, you and Tony, you know, we're talking about the medical culture. 
And you want to, that makes this even more challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely a stoicism to, uh, to this that we're taught from day one of medical school. There's no doubt about it. Uh, some refer uh, to it as the hidden curriculum, but uh, it's this, um, this idea that is born of the medical student that they are not to reach out when things get tough, that that actually is the time to um, battle down and, um, and push through. And there's some kind of reward at the end of that if you're able to do what you're supposed to do. Uh, and for John, right? That's what we're taught from day one. And that's not going to change when you're a resident. It's probably only strengthens. And that's certainly not going to change when you're an attending physician. And you have data on that, right? <laughs> and what there is, you use some, some data from, from Newark, I believe, on your students and the pattern they show. Mm -hmm. well, we, we were part of a nationwide study, so it was multiple schools across the mm -hmm. country. And what we showed is that students, when they start medical school at orientation before they began um, any type of education, had lower burnout scores, lower depression scores than age-related matched students in other fields. And then as they progressed through medical school, again, this is not just us, but across the country, it flipped. And the burnout scores and the depression scores were now higher compared to age-related, you know, matched people. And that was through residency and then through early physicianhood and then throughout the career. So it, it is a, it's a culture, for sure, of toughness um, that we learn and through denial. medical school. And, and, and self-cycling and enforced denial. In a sense, in a sense we're, we're, we are not taught to seek help. We are taught to, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, and you just, you know, you keep going and you keep it inside. And so this is a culture that I, we do need to change. And I think we saw a little bit of that in kind of the juxtaposition of some of the testimonials that we just saw. You had clinicians who said, you know, this event stayed with me. It made it difficult to sleep. I heard the voices at night. It, I, it made it difficult to get up and go to work the next day. But we also had a clinician who said, we have to go to work the next day. So we have to figure out how we move forward from this because we have to go to work the next day. And that pressure to perform, that pressure for perfection that is ingrained in the profession from even before medical school, right? I mean, that, that pressure for perfect grades, perfect character just to get into medical school. How do you manage that mindset when it is so ingrained? I think some of what we've uh, tried to do so far is really the normalization. So just as you know, you're hearing from different stories of clinicians that they've been through it, highlighting that people are not alone, that they are not isolated, even though the experience can be feeling very isolated, um, but other people are going through it. So things like the uh, Schwartz Center rounds, where people are sharing their stories. Uh, can so you want to explain what Schwartz rounds oh, are? Of course. <laughs> I never miss an opportunity to plug Schwartz Center rounds. <laughs> um, uh, all of the hospitals now within the RWJ uh, BH system have them. They are um, a nationally designated program where it is essentially an hour-long venting session. Um, for uh, dis people across various disciplines, it's open to everyone within the hospital. During COVID, we've moved them virtually, and we've also had unit-based rounds. So we've gone to, you know, we were in the MICU two weeks ago um, talking uh, with all of the providers there and all of the healthcare staff about what the impact this has been. And there's usually a panel of three people that start by sharing their stories, and then it really flips, and it's everyone that's present to talk about their stories with the idea that some people are going forward with their vulnerability, and their story may spark someone else to share their story. Um, and it's really talking that we don't have a great outlet in healthcare to talk about the ways in which our patients and doing this work impact us, both positive and negative. You know, we've had topics that are all about gratitude um, and, you know, humor in healthcare. And then we've had topics about, you know, what it is to be burned out, what it is to um, be in COVID, what has been our worst day ever, and why aren't we talking about it? So even just sitting in that room, hearing other people's stories, can be so powerful. And sometimes it's also hearing leadership stories as well and um, really modeling what it is to be an authentic leader and uh, vulnerable in, in that regard so that others can be as well. What, what other sort of uh, programs do we have at this point you know, in, the, in the system or in the hospital that are starting to reach out to people to support them? 
Um, I can I can share the new program. We just started it in back in the October, and it's a, a program that really to reinforce our connections with our peers. And we have two aspects of the program. Um, the first aspect is is the ability of having one-to-one -one peer support with a colleague who has been specially trained in the um, approaches to listening, to validating as a peer, understanding truly what that other person is going through as a colleague um, who helps perhaps look at things in a different way because when we're caught up in something, we tend to see it more negatively. So having an objective peer who really knows what you're going through can help you look at it in a different way and then remind you of your coping mechanisms. So we have 15 faculty uh, physicians at um, RWJ Medical School, RWJ UH, who actually are here for everyone, you know, for, for, for colleagues. And then we have another uh, different peer program, which is a peer discussion group. And we have about 25 faculty. There are groups of five to eight faculty who meet every other week to talk about some topics that are delivered to them through our office topics about meaning in medicine, similar to the Schwartz rounds. Meaning in medicine, appreciation, making a medical error, doctor-patient relationship, both you know rewarding or challenging. And it's, it's really both of those, whether it's group or one-to-one, -one, the message we want to give is that it's okay to have these feelings, to want to talk about these things. We don't have to keep it inside. And by talking about it, it becomes more of a prevention you know, I, I, as we talked about earlier, I love that phraseology that it's okay, because to you know, to Tony's point, medicine has long made the point that it's not okay. <laughs> that you know that you have to uh, suck it up, that you have to you know toe the line, that you're privileged to be in this situation and have you know particular responsibility. So it's not okay to fail. You know, it, it, uh, the power of just of the shame of failing. Um, it's not okay to fail. It's not okay to share. It's not okay to have these feelings at all. Um, and so I love that phraseology the, you know, that we can start to teach each other. And the same when you talk about Schwartz Run, or with these kind of interventions, we're starting to build an environment that it's okay to be human, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and and okay to be vulnerable. And I think maybe most importantly, by understanding that, you become not only yourself more comfortable with life, more likely to survive that life and find joy, you in the end become better at what you do, right? Yeah. I, think, I think also it would address any derealization and therefore burnout. I mean, if you're centered and grounded like that through, through the, uh, that kind of initiative, um, then yeah, then I think derealization is certainly addressed and therefore burnout by mm -hmm. definition mm -hmm. would also be addressed. I wanna make another comment too, a couple of things that I've heard. Um, the idea, I, I like the idea that there is no such thing right now as post-traumatic stress. We are still being stressed. There's no post to this pandemic just yet uh, because of the peak of uh, mental illness that, we, that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be in the midst of soon. Um, and then also with regard to those Schwartz rounds, connecting those two, I know that they're, uh, and then bringing in the idea of the primary care, primary preventive initiative, I know that there are different departments now that are having routine huddles um, after shifts. Uh, just to connect before mm -hmm. you go home, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the traditional debrief mode where we wait for something catastrophic to happen, then we meet in a debriefing. Uh, these are routine. Uh, these are huddles that take place immediately after a shift to prevent anything from happening thereon, making sure that anything that uh, was seen that perhaps prior to COVID would be considered to be routine, but now is no longer at that routine baseline. Uh, there's this, you know, kindling hypothesis, these subclinical insults that have happened over the past year now that have gotten us all primed that what was routine for us may now be a trigger. Uh, making sure that's addressed uh, after a shift. Uh, I know that there are definitely are um, departments uh, that are doing this, um, then I think, uh, can be tremendously helpful and really part of a primary uh, prevention initiative. I think that's a critical point. You know, as medical staff president, you know, I was in multiple situations where, you know, where primary was long ago earlier, you know, where a clinician had 
gone through a series of life events, personal events, et cetera, and, was, and was, had become burned out and then gone basically in the next step beyond that. So dealing with substance issues or major behavioral problems or major you know, problems with quality and safety and patient interaction. You know, and I love that terminology that, you know, that, uh, and the, the culture that you're talking about of primary prevention. That is, you know, we, we take this, we nurture this from the start. You know, this is, you know, this is, this is the kind of environment in which we create and we live. And I love that as a culture of an organization, you know, and of, you know, and of colleagues, you know, you know supporting each other. I think yeah. it's incredibly important. And what, what a great message, too, the team leader. And I actually, I actually got to see it um, once um, just because I was an innocent bystander as a psychiatrist in the hospital. Um, that um, a great message that the team leader just gathers you and just to check in before you get to go home. Right before well, you walk over to that doctor's parking. Position. And to be proactive versus yeah. reactive, right? Yeah. We've gotten better at doing it right after the fact if there's mm -hmm. an, uh, a distressing event, as you referred to. But to do it periodically, to build those relationships yeah. over time and that trust over time so that then colleagues have that basis and that foundation to be able to say to one another, you're, you're not yourself today. What's going on? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe highlight some of those uh, burnout symptoms. What I like about that is that... <clears throat> Tony pointed out earlier that the best person to note for you that this is happening is the person closest to you. But in theory, you're very close to a lot of your colleagues. Mm -hmm. But um, the rule for your relationship with your colleagues may be that we don't share these things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know that you know maybe you know we will you know operate together in for 14 hours in a critical situation and share all that emotional trauma, but we don't, but we don't share the base, the fact that, you know, I can't believe that that child died, um, you know, and that really hurt me, et cetera. So you're talking about creating an environment where there are others that are close to you and giving permission for them, you know, to share. Yeah. And, and I also think that, you know, we don't have to have necessarily a, a critical event happen that, you know, like you were mentioning before, Christine, you know, during the shorts rounds, there's time for appreciation as well. Mm -hmm. So let's say on days where there's not a particular event to discuss, these huddles can include, you know, it was really good to work with you today. I really liked when you did this. So that, that gratitude, uh, moments of mindfulness, of just appreciating what's happening, those are all preventive. They help that sense of community, which helps create the culture of wellness. It, it builds upon. And we're talking about formal programs for which there are links uh, right below this video here. If you look in the uh, description area on YouTube, you'll find those links. If you look in your emails uh, from the medical staff office, you'll find those links. We're talking about some semi-formal programs at the department level, but they don't have to be formalized programs, right? We can do things informally. Rutgers, during the pandemic, had that U plus two taking a moment to look intrinsically, look at yourself, check in with yourself, make sure you are okay, but then pick up the phone and call a couple colleagues and have that connectedness. All right, so let's, let's, let's uh, play this. So Chantal, you've noticed that I've kind of lost it in the last few weeks, et cetera, <laughs> you know, and then I'm snapping at patients, et cetera, and slamming my desk and my doors closed, which is usually open, et cetera. What do you say to me, Chantal? So, Jim, you don't look quite like yourself today, it seems to me. I, I'm, I don't want to pry, but what can, what's going on? You're just not acting the same as your usual self. Well, you know, the last few weeks have been uh, kind of hard. I guess I've been really tired. I think I'm just not getting enough sleep, um, but I'm okay. What do you mean not getting enough sleep? Well, you know, I'm here at the hospital, you know, late, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work because of what's been going on, mm. you know, with you know, the COVID in the hospital, et cetera. But, you know, some, you have those times. I mean, I used to say, when I was an intern, I used to go 36 hours and you sleep. You know, I'm okay. It's just, you know, this, I'll, I'll be okay. But it sounds really rough. It sounds like a rough time. Because not having sleep is, it, it can really make it hard to function during the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess you're right. I yeah. guess you're right, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I'll, you know, I'll get some time this weekend. I, I, I think. It, nonetheless, it still has to be really rough for you. What, what else has been going on apart from lack of sleep? How does it, like, for example, how does that affect your day? 
Well, I, um, you know, the, it's hard to keep up with your records, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I'm terrible with my records anyway, and now when I'm tired, I have difficulty with you know, getting dictations. So now, you know, the med staff office is driving us to dictations. Well, you know, I'll catch up with that. So it's, you know, these things happen, you know, these, these kind of times. But it's, it's a challenging time. It's, a, it's harder than I thought it would be. It, yeah, it sounds like it's really been rough for you. You know, um, when you've been in situations like this before, what have you done to sort of, you know, just take care of yourself a little bit or take a break? Well, you really can't right now with, you know, the COVID and everything, so you can't get away and it's hard to have time, et cetera. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a tough time. Yeah. You know what it is, though? I, I mean, I, I, I find for myself, you know, being stuck in this all day long stress, you know, since, since COVID, we never really have downtime. There's kind of this blur, blurriness between home time and work time, and work time is so long. So I find that if I take little mini breaks through the course of the day, it really breaks down. Like it breaks up my day and it makes it easier. At the end of the day, I'm not as exhausted say, as mm. I am. I mean, um, let me, that's, I, it's not a crazy idea, you know, because I kind of stopped taking lunch and stuff. So let me, let me think about it. I think one of the main, uh, main things uh, to consider here uh, and just to reassure is that anybody can stop and ask a peer, how are you, how are you doing? Um, you don't have to have training like Chantel or myself with regard to a degree in psychiatry or being boarded to be able to do this, right? Any, any peer can stop any, any peer and check in and, and ask how they're doing. And that would open up just a conversation between two people that is often in and of itself somewhat therapeutic. Right. Mm -hmm. I tried um, actually not to. Right, I know, <laughs> I know. I thought, you did I, thought, very I, thought well. I was resisting the I thought, temptation yeah, I thought it was as well. Just being, I think basically <laughs> just showing that you care, that yeah. you've noticed the mm -hmm. person. Because mm -hmm. I think earlier we were talking about how this feels isolating, even in the middle of a crowd, um, and that you've noticed that that person is uh, drifted, mm -hmm. you know, and in trouble. I think that's an, that's an import, important thing. So, Tonto, you were talking earlier about appreciation, and that it reminded me of that there is not only the appreciation of your peers, but there's also the appreciation of the beauty in the world and the beauty mm -hmm. in, in life, et cetera, which frankly got me thinking about the loss of connection to spirituality, um, to God, um, to community that has occurred so much um, through this, uh, this pandemic. I mean, a tremendous isolation and loss, et cetera. So Christine, mm -hmm. thoughts on yeah. how people might connect with this? Yeah. Um, First, just going back a moment to the lovely little uh, role play that we got to see, I would say that that could be a cross check, right? We are in this organization where HRO is very important. We help people to remind themselves to, uh, you know, sanitize their hands in and out. That can be a well-being cross check, just checking in with your peers. And when we look at, um, you know, what gives us. Um, uh, joy and meaning within our lives. We have aspects of uh, spirituality, which is true for people that claim a faith tradition or say, you know, uh, you know, that's not how they identify. And the three areas that we look at where we have potential for spiritual distress is in relationship to uh, God or that which is divine. Uh, people call that by different names. It may just be the universe and feeling connected um, with a larger power or force of some sort. Uh, there's also connection to others. So it, we kind of think of it, you know, maybe connection this way, connection to others as well, and then connection to ourselves. And so what we're concerned with is if there's a uh, kind of a brokenness in any of those areas, that can really cause additional distress. So right now we do have uh, people maybe questioning God or questioning why this is happening, those existential meaning-making questions, which can be great when it gives us framework and it gives us a sense of what is going on and how we're interpreting our role in that. But it can cause disconnect when we don't have the answers or when we're feeling alienated or isolated from, from God or not knowing why something is happening. And then the community is so much of how people experience um, uh, you know, life and vitality. If I go into a patient's room and they say, oh, I don't believe in God, I'm like, okay, what do you believe in? What does ground you? So often people say family. Um, and the love of family and not being able to see family or, or not see them apart from on a screen uh, has a detrimental impact. So really trying ways to connect even when connection 
has been made difficult. And then the self, I think, is what we've been talking about, right? So when we feel disconnected from ourselves, you know, we may feel foggy or that we're having, you know, moments where we're not enjoying our work or not um, feeling as confident in our role. I'm hearing that from providers a lot, feeling that helplessness. Um, that's also an, an area where we want to look at, okay, what does ground me? What does help me connect to myself? That's really a remarkable observation, you know, for, and it goes back almost to our conversation about fatigue, you know, you know, because that makes it harder for me to connect to people, you know, that makes it harder to, you know, look around and see what I think is in, in important and positive, et cetera, you know, and, and, and may make it harder to see, you know, what gives my, gives my life meaning. You know, human beings are meaning machines. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we spend our, our lives trying to to give meanings to the to the events, and for some people, you know, meaning is you know is, is cooking dinner for their family. You can't, mm -hmm. you know. For some people, it's coming together, you know, to uh, to play tennis. You can't. Um, for other people, it's travel, you know, other show, etc. But we've had a real disconnection from our ability to find meaning, you know, in mm -hmm. our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, you know, and this goes back to what the original things that you said, honey, et cetera, that as we come out of this acute area, but go on with the rest of our lives, which are going to be continuing, you know, continually challenging. We have a lot of work to do in this system, in this hospital for our patients, and, you know, all the change that is, occurs, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to be certain that each individual is able to find meaning again and ground again, and I think this is going to be real work that we have as a, as a community of caregivers um, and, uh, you know, as a medical staff and as, you know, you know, that we have to really work to do. I agree. I don't think there's any time where finding meaning or refinding, rediscovering spirituality is as important as it will be in the next six, six months. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also part of finding meaning is to be able to see what's positive. And one of the things is, you know, just as human beings, we tend to see problems first before positive, only because it's a survival issue, right? Mm -hmm. Because a problem is something to be solved, whereas something that's not a problem can be dismissed as something that's not a threat. Mm -hmm. And then in medical education... That's a medical model too, right? And, well, <laughs> it, exactly. In medical education, you know, we're trained to, what's the problem? What's the diagnosis? You know, we look for the negative so that we can fix it. And so... We, we, we need to intentionally, especially in moments of stress like what we've been through with COVID-19, but in any stress, this tendency to see the negative is even heightened. There's even more of that tendency. Mm -hmm. So we have to intentionally, and that's part of you know, the meaning piece, intentionally look. Maybe there were three little things that were good that happened today. And intentionally look at them. And you can actually retrain your mind to look at that. Those are things that can be done in huddles or in meetings. I've seen it done in yeah. leadership meetings where you take five minutes at the beginning of a meeting and you just talk about three good things that happen. Or you mm -hmm. think about three good things that happen with your spouse at the end of the day, your significant other, or you think just to yourself before you go to bed. But that can help maintain some of that meaning as you go through. Those yeah. are one, those would, that would be sort of a, um, something that a person can do individually, but you can also do with your peers or in huddles and groups. Yeah. And the research backs that up. You know, some people have uh, a gratitude practice um, and they followed that and um, people have higher levels of resilience and lower levels of stress if they can point to something even so small. I think that's, that's where people get tripped up. They think they have to be grateful or um, uh, see the positive in everything, but no, it, it, it can be very incremental and over time. Mm -hmm. Very interesting to think at a broader level as a hospital, as a system of caregivers who have a greater focus on wellness itself as a concept of giving, as opposed to con and, uh, of giving care, you know, as opposed to, you know, always looking, you know, for you know, the illness. You know, and the flaw. It's a very interesting you know, way, way of looking at, at the world. So, final thoughts? Things that we should make sure to emphasize? I would say stay connected with your peers. Um, take time to think about good things that happen, even if they're very small. Um, acknowledge that it's a hard time. Have some self compassion. Yep. 
I, I, again, I've, I've, I've stated this and it's worth restating uh, that um, the end of the COVID pandemic, it will be the beginning of another pandemic uh, in mental health. So um, we should all be ready for that to take it, to take it on. And I think staying connected will be a, it's a great first step. Uh, I think to be gentle with yourself, right? We've never gone through a pandemic like this before and to uh, be gentle, be as gentle with yourself as you would be um, with your peer or your colleague, right? If you had a colleague that said, you know, I'm not sleeping, you know, my guess is uh, you would, um, or if you said that to a colleague, my guess is that your colleague would be concerned. And so be concerned about yourselves as well. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out for help. I think sometimes that takes so much courage, uh, but to not do that is a disservice to you and to your patients. I think that goes back to something Dr. Brezzo, you said early on, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I find a discussion like this particularly exciting and positive because it shows the commitment of this med staff, this hospital, the system, I've heard Barry Strowski talk about and support this idea to the idea of wellness uh, and how critical it is that we heal each other, support each other. So um, while obviously the challenges you know, are in front of us, um, I think this is a solid step along that journey uh, together. Um, and I thank all of you for taking the time you know, this, this evening to, uh, to talk about this. Um, you know, we will undoubtedly have to have you back, you know, as we, as we go forward. Um, and I wish you all, you know, a wonderful evening. Dr. Anthony Tobia, Christine Davies, Dr. Chantal Brousseau, thank you all so much for joining us. And just remember, if you do need help, there are resources available for you. There are links right now, right here, just below our video on the description on YouTube. You can go to your emails from the medical staff office. There are resources available to you. And if you can, pick up a phone, call a colleague, see how they're doing, check in. We're all here for one another. It's one medical staff, and we're all, we're all part of this. So I hope you um, learned a great deal from the program that you just listened to or watched. And I will tell you, it wasn't easy for me to talk. You know, you heard me give my testimonial. But I felt that by doing so, I would help others. And I think everyone who spoke feels the same way as I do. What we do is difficult. It's dangerous. And it has far-reaching implications for everyone whose life we touch. And I hope that this program today helps you cope, helps strengthen you, so you can continue to do your good work. There were several instances during the, the panel where you saw um, messages through which you could contact various services that we offer to help you cope if you're having difficulties of any kind and I sincerely hope you utilize these services. I thank you again for everything you do. I hope you found this compelling and helpful and be well. Carry on. <laughs>